Lieutenant Jordy LaForge's visor shows him when people are lying. Klingons do not faint. And Dr. Pulaski and Commander Riker are missing epithelial cells. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule, starring Sirach Lofton. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> also starring amazing producer Ryan T. Husk. Well, hi there, everybody. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Next Generation <laughs> episode, Up the Long Ladder. My name is Mohamed Noor. I'm a professor of biology at Duke University and an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. Fantastic. Yeah. That Amazing. is Dr. Muhammad Noor, everybody. All right. Yeah. Uh, also, this was written by Melinda M. Snodgrass, directed by yeah. Weinrich Colby. And this was May 20th, 1989. Where were you? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into this episode. Uh, there's a ton of science in the back half of this episode. Uh, your thoughts, Dr. Noor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's get right into it. <laughs> oh, by the way, can we just say you are an an evolutionary biologist as well? You know all about chromosomes and DNA. You have what are you up, up to five or six clones right now in your shed? So you mm -hmm. know uh, no, we're up to seven now. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, you know, Mohammed, some of the things as I was watching, I was thinking about the science and of this episode and uh, you know, because I'm not familiar with, with all of the concepts and, and whether these things are accurate or true. Uh, my first question to you is, is the basis of what they're saying true? Yes, that's the short answer is yes. Actually, it's it's quite good on the science front for that aspect to it. So there's a term that they use in there, which which is a made up term. This is not a real scientific term, but it, honestly, it's better than the real scientific term, which is replicative fading. And the idea from that is, I mean, you can think of it almost like a copier machine, like an old old Xerox or whatever brand copier, that if you take a copy of something and they take a copy of a copy and a copy of a copy of a copy, eventually it starts it starts looking like, like that. <laughs> it you've lost a lot of information there. That is actually true. And this is one of the problems with asexual reproduction. Like if we just, you know, just produced, a, a, like if I just produced another Muhammad, as Ryan was saying, the ones I have in the shed, if I produced another <laughs> Muhammad and that Muhammad produced another Muhammad, there are always mutations introduced, right? In every generation, there's new mutations. Nothing is fixing them. Nothing is replacing them. So when you replicate after that, you're replicating not just me, but me with a mutation, and then me with two mutations, then me with three mutations, you know, things like that. So essentially, it would get worse and worse and worse every generation because nothing is going in there to fix it. You're not getting this infusion from what you would get from sexual reproduction from the other gender, right? So you know, let's say, for example, I have some mutations that say from... Let's say I got a mutation from my dad. I may not have gotten that from my mom. So when I pass on to my kids, I can give my mom's copy. And then that mutation from my dad is gone. Can but, I hit a quick pause there? Sure. Uh, mutations. We understand that that is almost, it feels like it's almost the the basic building blocks of evolution, the way I understand Correct. it. Mutations, well said. mutations are the creation of, of evolution. That's, that's that how reforms. we evolve, right? As far yeah. as we know. Um, yeah. So the question is, most are, of them are bad. <laughs> okay. And are we mutations, genetic mutations, generally dominant or submissive? Like when you said, if you get a mutation yeah. from your dad, but your mom can kind of counterbalance that, is that a a general thing or is it case by case? Let me answer two parts to that. For the first part, when you think about mutations, they tend to be bad because when you think about it, over time, we are the product of long-term natural selection or evolution, right? So you can think of us kind of like a car. And you can think of a mutation like taking a hammer and throwing it at the car. What are the odds it's going to make it better? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not zero, <laughs> but it's right. pretty close to zero. So that's one aspect to it, right? Now, right. your question about dominant or recessive. So that's just basically like would it manifest? Because, like, I mean, again, we have two copies of all our genes and two copies of all our chromosomes. So let's say, as I mentioned, I got one from my dad. I did not get one from my mom. I'm making this up. You know, nothing is my dad. <laughs> Generally speaking, most bad mutations tend to be loss of function. So let's say, for example, this is something that's supposed to help your arm grow. And like you get a broken part, a broken copy. Generally speaking, those tend to be recessive. So if you have the other copy is good, you're all right. And this is one of the reasons, actually, that inbreeding is bad. Like if you have kids with your sister, right, or brother, you know, depending on which gender you are, um, if you have kids with your sibling, 
what you're doing is you're pulling together these two recessive bad mutations because you like your, your sibling likely got the same one that you did from your parent and you're putting them both together. And that's one of the reasons that you tend to have what's referred to as inbreeding depression. As you have inbreeding, you start manifesting these bad mutations, which are already present. Whereas if I, you know, like I did, I, mean, I have kids with somebody completely unrelated to me. She probably has some bad mutations, but they're completely different from mine. So my kids are uber healthy. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, and so that basically means, uh, if I remember correctly, my whatever seventh grade biology or something, that the, it actually strengthens the species to do a breeding completely outside of yes, your family. your group, you know, your family. Yes. Okay, uh, because yes. of that that exact reason exactly. that you mentioned, and this is kind of what they're talking about in this episode. They don't want to just you know even just obviously they can't keep breeding between the five of them over and over again but even if there were 20 of all them, related very soon right or yeah. even if there were 20 or 30 of them they would all still be in that same family but if you've yeah. got a completely distant and separate group yeah. but even then it was only what they say 30 couples well so it was interesting that the comment was made that they wanted a breeding group of 30 but they also said but now it was interesting how the guy interpreted it versus what which what they what dr pulaski actually said she said we need each woman to have uh three kids from at least three different men and he's like oh i get three wives like she didn't say that <laughs> <laughs> she said each woman have three kids from three different men so it's possible there are three men total and they're having all the kids from all the different women <laughs> right i mean she mm -hmm. didn't say that. that that obviously would be bad because then you would have inbreeding right basically the closer you are to an even sex ratio the better in terms of maintaining a large uh, amount of variation in your population right and yeah. that's actually one of the oh go ahead please no the, i was just going to say as far as the the cloning thing i had heard that in different uh a different set of biology in in plants for example mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, people that i know or that i've read about that grow certain kinds of plants <laughs> like um, what kind what are we talking about, Rock? I got some tomato. I got tomato yeah. plants out there, and I know exactly no, what you mean. Oh yes, yes, certain kinds of plants. But there are these certain kinds of plants where they do clone um, from these plants and try to make a next batch of those uh, plants. Mm -hmm. But there, I've I've heard of the problem that you can only clone so much. Um, because of this same problem, you would yep. lose, you would lose potency. You would, you would yep. just not have the same out, outcome as far as the product. Yep. So, no, so I've exactly heard true. this concept used in plants before, as far as you know, how much, how much you can clone from a, a plant, but um, not really in in the sense of people, but it does work the same way. Absolutely. Exactly the same problem. It doesn't really matter what the organism is. Essentially, if you have asexual reproduction, if you're just making a clone off a clone off a clone, eventually you're just introducing more and more mutations. There's nothing to get rid of them. And that's where that, that replicative fading comes from. What's interesting is what the actual technical term for it is called Muller's ratchet. If you think about what? a ratchet, remember it? Yeah, I know. Well, it's named after a guy, Muller, Herman, Herman Muller, who actually won the Nobel Prize for discovering that X-rays cause mutations. This is back in like the 1940s. But the reason they call it Muller's ratchet is because he was using this analogy of a ratchet. You know how a ratchet only goes one way? Like it only yeah. turns the, the screw one way. So that's basically what he was saying is happening when you have, you know, this accumulation of bad mutations, it's just worse, 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 like a hmm. ratchet. Okay. Screwing uh, the population worse and worse over time. Interesting. <laughs> You know, I just realized something. It, this episode is called Up the Long Ladder, and that just makes me think of a DNA strand. Oh, I didn't even right? Think it about just that. looks like it oh. just looks like a spiraling ladder, right? I mean, yeah, or yeah, yeah. I don't know what, 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 why double is it helix. Called? Yeah. Yeah. The double helix of the, the ladder. Yeah. yeah. That's a good call. I didn't even think about that. Me neither. So, so just, replicative yeah. fading is not a word. That is just something that was completely, uh, it's kind better. Of made up. It's just actually because it makes more sense to me than Mueller's ratchet, which I've got to like. Love. <laughs> no, totally. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know who made it up. I've never heard it in any biology class, but I mean, it makes perfect sense. That's exactly right. <laughs> I've used it actually in my classes fading. sometimes. So it's saying like, well, you could think of it like, let's call it, for example, replicative fading. <laughs> it works. Yeah. It happens to be from Star Trek. <laughs> Another science question that kind of popped up to me, and um, they made a reference about um 
where they would take cells from in order to get optimal reproductive kind of um, cellular growth or whatever it is. And and they talked about the lining of the stomach, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's what Dr. Pulaski talked about. Is mm-hmm. there any truth to where you would uh, gather your cells from if you were to, to take a sample from a person? So I have to give credit to our mutual friend, Dr. Anne Marie Siegel, because we actually did a we actually did a recording once about this particular episode for something else. Really? And she said yes. And she said those stomach epithelial cells basically act kind of like stem cells. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, they can they can differentiate into a whole bunch of different things. So she's I'm credit to her for that. I didn't actually know that, but yeah. It shout, was out very, to, it was... shout out to Dr. Anne Marie Siegel, aka Trekkie MD, that Muhammad gave that name to her, Trekkie MD. She's our associate producer yeah. and does research and development for us for that very reason. Anyway, you were saying, yeah. Dr. North. I love I loved how dramatic it was when they had those, those syringes coming down from really high. <laughs> it was so <laughs> dramatic. What the are music, y'all doing? <laughs> the music was great, though, for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the high, the the. It was like you know the torture scene in the uh, in the movies when they're like about to get you. It's always like from far away, like here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, that was my other question too. Is uh, you know they didn't explain the memory loss that occurred between uh franks and and pulaski right so we're assuming that some process occurred in which they were able to erase their memory right is is that what we're assuming yeah Yeah. it's interesting it was very it wasn't just they lost all their short-term memories but it was very specifically from that yeah right so that was like whoa okay but i mean but star trek does that all the time they're always tampering with memories there's no I, i don't know a biological basis for that aspect but Right, right. It's it's that's, it was it was super specific. Like, and we remember up until this exact second. I'm like, well, how were they able to get that done? <laughs> <laughs> They've mapped they, they, the brain really well in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they're that good, then they should be able to get rid of the anomalies that occur from the replica to fading. I mean, right? You know, exactly. Honestly, <laughs> that actually that that's a good point too, in the sense that I mean. Today, we could probably identify a lot of these mutations and, you know, you could use some sort of engineering things to probably fix a lot of them too. We, I don't think we could do it perfectly, but I imagine like hundreds of years from now, it does feel like they should be able to, to kind of fix that. They would have them, they would have essentially like, here's the full genome sequence from one end of the chromosome to the other end of the yeah. chromosome for every chromosome. And let's just edit. Anytime we see any deviation, we'll edit it in your sperm or eggs or whatever for the... Or actually, I guess they weren't even using sperm and eggs, I guess, in, in your copy. <laughs> Aren't we your getting animal. kind of close to that already? Like where they're able to identify certain things in the DNA, like they can actually see one thing in the DNA and know what that uh, relates to or correlates. Well, to. so this would actually be easier than that. Uh, this would be because today what we do is we look at something we don't know what it means. And we and we try to figure out if this is what's causing a particular disease. With that one, all they need to do is just we know this is the same as that first guy. That's all they need to do. So if they have a sequence of that first guy, it doesn't matter what like whether what this particular A, T, G, or C does or that one does. You just want the letters to be identical. So you could go through and use some genetic editing to do that. That seems like that would be pretty feasible and be easier than what people try to do today. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so that that would be the anomaly that would occur in the mutation. It would yeah. be the mutation would be somewhere on that strand. Mm-hmm. There's a G instead of an A or something exactly. to that degree. Exactly. That, that's, that's what the mutations would be. It would be something like that. So it could be a, a letter change. It could also be like a, a gene got flipped or a section of DNA got flipped, or it could be a section got just deleted completely. Those are the kinds of mutations we tend to see. Often it's just like you said, it's often just like used to be an A and now it's a G. That's a very common one. Mm-hmm. So it should be so relatively easy to fix 150 or so years. Uh, 120. We already now. know how to fix those now. <laughs> okay. We already can do that now. <laughs> okay. But this it's was, just, it just would be tough to do in one single cell embryo and get it exactly right. That, that's the only hard part. But we have the technology to do it. Uh, wow. And also, Mohammed, um, relative to the time that this episode is being written, and in 1989 yeah. or thereabouts, yeah. um, what was the the where were we at yeah. technology wise Great as question. far as this particular subject matter was concerned? that's a wonderful question it's a very thoughtful thing to, uh, to be thinking about with regard to it um 
DNA had been, we had gotten DNA sequences. It was possible to get some DNA sequences, but when people got a DNA sequence, it would be, so we have in our bodies 3.1 billion letters. Okay. 3.1 billion. And, you know, and, and, and two copies, one from mom, one from dad, right? Um, mm -hmm. You could get a stretch and amplify it and study it. And that stretch would be something like, you know, say 900. <laughs> <laughs> of those letters out of okay. the 3.1 pillar. And it was wow. and there was some effort involved in that too. It wasn't just a like you just do it. It was a little bit of it, it was like it would take you a couple of days to to get that. Okay. So that's a big and like we we're nowhere near for I think that I don't remember actually when they decided to embark upon the overall human genome project. That might be before. I'm not sure exactly when that process started. Mm -hmm. Certainly by the 19 mid 1990s, the human genome project was in full swing. But even there, like we were nowhere near done, <laughs> like nowhere near done. Yeah, I remember hearing about that in a physiology mm -hmm. class in like 90. I don't remember what early 90s or something. Right. And yeah. they had just really kind of started in earnest to yeah. map out the entire human genome. And I remember yeah. my professor and, and just, or my teacher that. saying like, it's gonna be, we, we're super excited. He's like, it's gonna be like 20 years, guys. <laughs> Relax, yeah. it's gonna be luckily, a while. Luckily, it's there, was a up, of course. there was a technological innovation that happened around 96, 97, which was, it was referred to as shotgun sequencing, which was the idea of basically just shred all the DNA and and then use, the, use this process to just sequence random pieces and then use computers to put it together and be like, oh, this one has an overhang of AGC and this one has an overhang of AGC, but it's on the other end. You put them together and piece it and then try to figure out what the overall thing was. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was a big innovation of doing this very – instead of very – you know going from base number 100 to 110 and then 110 to 120, like let's just put the whole thing in, shred it, and let the computers put it together. That was gigantic. And the ability to actually sequence a lot more at that time too helped. Now, Dr. now it's Nor, crazy. Now it's great. You can get like a whole genome sequence for a thousand dollars. Like you could just do it. Like we literally have undergrads who will do this as part of their summer projects <laughs> where it was before this like 20 year project by like the entire, mm -hmm. you know, teams of scientists back then. <laughs> it's very slow. Yes. Yeah. Now, Dr. Nor, uh, professor at Duke University, of course, uh, I'm right now. I want to jump on to <laughs> Sirach's very thoughtful question and add to it or take it the, the next step, which is you are the science consultant for the new Next Generation show in 2024, and they are redoing this a, episode. Not <laughs> they are redoing this episode, considering how much you know technology has changed in the last 35 years, if any, in this mm. particular field. What would you or what would they do differently? Honestly, this one was pretty good. <laughs> like the, the, I, I don't have too much to nitpick with this one at all. I mean, I, there's and, and as you all know, you've had me on the show many times before. There's plenty of episodes I will nitpick a lot. This one, I mean, the the yeah. overall basis, this idea of the replicative fading. I mean, uh, and the fact they even came up with a term that's better than the real scientific <laughs> term. Yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, the the few things maybe I, I might try to come up with some explanation why they don't ha why don't they don't have the ability to actually just edit the mutations themselves and have a have a, a genome sequence to know what the reference would be, I guess. But I mean, it's not crazy. <laughs> it's just a little funny. Um, Doctor Nora, is there a way to get the same results instead of doing it the way they did through the cell linings and taking the cells out? Is there a way, for example, because uh, I, I thought when they initially asked, they were asking for something different, like a, um, I thought it was like a sperm donation that they were asking. Because the, the look yeah. on Picard's face was like, <laughs> like are you serious? Uh, but so is that, it, that could have worked though, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Actually, let me ask you guys a question. Would you, have, I was surprised how that when they said like oh nobody's gonna agree to do that like you got like a thousand people on your ship nobody's gonna agree to this and you yeah, only when, need like 30 of them to say yes i was a little when surprised picard, that. when you mean when picard spoke on behalf of the ship he said nobody yeah. will want to do that like i'm sure Riker, if white Riker were there he'd be like uh hey you just don't listen <laughs> to him he doesn't know what why don't you go go sit in the chair picard i got this yeah, I was a little surprised. I don't know what you guys thought about that. Were you, were, like, would you accept that idea if somebody said, hey, I mean, we might make a clone of you? I mean, it's not you. It's just somebody who's genetically the same. It's kind of like an identical twin of you. It's not you. Well, that's why I was asking about the, you know, like what effort does it take? And now, maybe I wouldn't want to go undergo, undergo surgery to get it done, but I would probably say, hey, 
can I donate a hair follicle or um, maybe like a sperm sample? Like there would be ways in which you could offer the same kind of help to that pe those people. And I, I don't know if it would necessarily bother. It would bother me to have a clone of me where I live and reside, but not in some far away. Exactly. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. If, if I don't you are helping, it, if I don't have to see him, it's fine. Yeah. If you're helping <laughs> to preserve and save an entire population, mm -hmm. it does feel, I don't want to say unethical, but it's certainly uncaring to not like if it, if all it takes is for you to like put aside a little awkwardness and be like, all right, so there's going to be a few, you know, Ryan's or Sirach's or Muhammad's out there doing their thing, you know, making that little planet a better place and saving that population. Uh, I don't see what the harm is. Yeah. Oh, actually, there is one thing I, I would I would change. It was interesting to me that they were somehow making these into full grown adults. That that was weird to me. I didn't understand why it wasn't just like an embryo that then would grow up. And like, I didn't understand how they were all just immediately adults. adults. Yeah, that that yeah. was weird. I didn't I didn't get why I didn't I didn't understand why that was true, and I didn't understand how that would be true. That that was just well, weird to me. There I would be no process much. to expedite the natural growth, right? I mean, you couldn't just start at an adult. Right? It no. needs all those nutrients and proteins to like fill yeah. up. Well, it's well, almost it's, like they had a shell when they felt like, like they thought they could just put this in. They're like, what? What is happening here? It's yeah, a that, golem. That, 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 I forgot about that piece. That was weird. It was yeah, a golem. That's why. Which, which leads me to my next question for both of you, which is, and we only have a, a couple minutes left with you, Dr. Noor here, but my question is, I was a little thrown back by the fact that they're like, oh, there's a clone of me. Let me kill it. And yes. I, look, I don't know if that's a necessarily a scientific <laughs> question because we don't have clones of people. It feels yeah. more like an ethical question. But I mean, if, if that's like basically an adult yeah, human they're in alive. the making. Yeah. Is that is that ethical? I didn't think so. I thought mm. I thought it was not. I mean, yes, they're vegetative, but I mean, yeah, but if you see someone vegetative stays, okay, just come take a phase or two of them. Like what? And Pulaski, he looks <laughs> yeah. at Pulaski and she's like, Yeah, do it. Yeah. Mm, she was bloodthirsty. Yeah, I, I thought it was more <laughs> weird that they didn't even consult with the captain in order to get that done. So normally I would think they would say, Captain, we're, we we want to talk with you. They took a clone of us. We need to go destroy it. And we'll, you know, we, some kind of permission or something. They were like, oh, let's go. And they just <laughs> they went right just, to the... <laughs> They went straight. They did not pass go. No, no, <laughs> no, pad, no consulting. Totally. What should we do? It was just like, no, we're going to pop up on the spot right now. I thought that was weird. But I had another question for you, Mom, because I know sure. you're going to leave us soon. But on the science tip, another question I had. If this uh, vessel, this USS Mariposa, if it had dead bodies on it uh, as part of the wreckage, would they be oh. able to use those uh, bodies as samples to clone from? That's a great question. So it, it, the answer is it kind of depends on exactly what they're doing. If they just needed to know what the DNA sequence is, yeah, I mean, we do that now. We have like DNA sequences from Neanderthal. I mean, obviously they weren't alive when this was done, so that's right. easy. But if they actually have to take these stem cells and grow them up, then it depends on how long it's been dead. Like basically mm -hmm. like our, is, is every cell dead, things like that. Because if, if they just passed away, let's say, you know, an hour ago, yeah, it'd probably be fine. But if they passed away, say like a couple of years ago, yeah, odds are the stem cell there is, are the stem cells there are all all of them are dead, <laughs> so that probably okay. wouldn't work. So I it depends see. on okay. how they're doing, and it seems like they're doing it more based on the stem cell idea rather than we know what the DNA sequence is. We can just insert this into the nucleus of a cell and make it go. But which was, that, which was uh, the Jurassic Park theory, yeah, right? right? They yeah. they didn't they didn't base it on a stem cell, right? They just got the DNA sequencing and somehow built it off like frogs or something frog yeah, eggs they, or i forget what it was it was something like frog eggs and then they just edited a couple of letters there to make it match dinosaurs or something make it like go that, from yeah. an amphibian to a reptile somehow I yeah, or maybe they started with a reptile. i don't remember what i don't know i think they i think they they started with live cells from the uh the thing that was frozen in the amber or the molasses yeah it was the, the blood uh, the blood of uh inside of a mosquito's yeah, belly i think inside of a mosquito exactly but I think I think that was just how they got the DNA sequence. I don't think that's actually the the. I think that's how they just oh, knew the what the dinosaur would have. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I think the cell was like, I don't remember if it was some sort of reptile or amphibian. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in this episode. Yeah, uh, it was fun. You know, another Melinda Snodgrass uh, specialty. You know, she's yep. she definitely gives us a lot to chew on when she writes an episode. And I think this one is just uh, in line with, you know, the kind of quality she puts into the research of her principles and her ideas where she wants to, you know, base her thoughts off. Uh, I thought this was good. And wasn't there a big kind of scare around this time of like this kind of thing, like cloning and body snatchers and this kind? I thought this there was a this was the beginning of that time in which we started to become aware of these kinds of concepts a little bit or yeah. become fearful of them. I'm thinking I'm thinking about eight years later, like when they had Dolly the sheep and things like that. That's one of those are the right. that's the time I'm thinking with that sort of stuff. I don't remember it from nineteen eighty nine, but at the same time I was in college. I mean I'd I pop it's possible I just missed it. <laughs> I do remember that sheep debate. It was a big debate yeah. with the sheep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, Dr. Knorr, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule over at Duke University between meetings and classes. Uh, we also appreciate your cool seventh rule poster behind you, as well as Discovery. I see Lower Decks, uh, Strange New Worlds. Can't tell what the other one is, but I also see Prodigy. a Prodigy. I also see a Prodigy. Terran Prodigy. Empire to your right. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, there we go. There's a Terran Empire one, too. Well, thank you yeah. very much. And uh, everybody, thank you, you can... for having me. It's always a pleasure to see you guys. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you, Dr. And Dr. always remember the seventh rule. You can follow <laughs> Muhammad, everybody, at M A F. Nor, right? That's Muff Nor. Thanks very much, Muhammad. Everybody stick around. We will be right back on the seventh rule.